Congress is in a final sprint towards trillions in spending and the tax hikes to pay for it. At the center of this high stakes moment is a deceptively simple goal, infrastructure overhaul. Lawmakers could learn a thing or two on the subject from Suzanne Shank, the president and CEO of investment bank Siebert William Shank, one of the nation's leading municipal debt underwriters with a specialty in how to fund infrastructure projects. She began her career as an engineer before she realized she could have more impact financing projects than designing them. On this episode of Influencers, Suzanne joins me to talk about her assessment of the spending package in Washington, the surge in IPOs during the pandemic, and what corporate diversity truly requires. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Suzanne Shank, CEO of Siebert Williams and Shank, a Wall Street firm. Suzanne, thanks so much for joining us. Nice to see you. Andy, good to see you too, and thank you for having me. Of course. Why don't we start off by uh, telling people about Siebert Williams and Shank for those of us who are not so familiar with the firm? What type of banking do you do, and how big are you, for instance? Well, the firm is a full service investment bank, which has become actually one of the most active underwriters of publicly traded equities, corporate investment grade debt and municipal bonds. And we also provide strategic advisory services and asset management. It just happens that our firm is, we have about 135 employees and we are both majority women owned and majority owned by people of color. And one of the founders besides yourself was Muriel Siebert, uh, a Wall Street legend who I had the pleasure of meeting years ago. Tell me about your relationship with her and how you got to know her. Yes, Mickey had a huge influence on my career. Um, I started on Wall Street in 1987, had been working uh, diligently at several firms moving my way up. Um, really kept my head down and had no aspiration of becoming an entrepreneur. But Mickey Siebert approached me and another uh, banker to start a firm wholly owned by women and minorities. And literally, we had dinner at a New York restaurant, shook hands and started the firm the next day. So she was a fighter, as you know, the first woman to have a seat on the exchange. Um, She uh, never... Uh, went to college. Um, She understood the battle of having a firm like ours exist. And um, we initially started really in the muni space and grew to, you know, now being a firm that is very active in most sectors of the market. Um, Mickey taught me so much and, um, you know, I really miss her. Um, She became just such a wise um, advisor whenever we faced, you know, a big issue in the business. Um, It was the first person I would pick up and call and given her breadth of experience and her trailblazing history, you know, she always had very sage advice to share. And when was that dinner? What year did you start the firm? 19, uh, it's been 25 years actually, Mm -hmm. October 1, yes, 1996. Oh, congratulations on the anniversary. Yes. So you guys are a small bank, though, compared to, of course, the giants like Goldman or Bank of America. How do you compete against them? Well, uh, we compete differently in different sectors. So in the muni space, um, we actually compete head to head. Um, We've done deals as small as three million up to, you know, a little over a billion dollars as lead manager, as sole lead manager. And um, we've really built a, a desk and a banking team that, you know, they have resumes from all over the street and they compete head to head. And we have tons of repeat business. In the corporate space, um, I would say our position is one of many, many years of um, serving clients and building relationships. So, for example, we have over 44. Fortune 500 clients as 
um, where we provide commercial paper services. In that sector, we compete head to head with other firms and are often told by those companies that we are their best performer. Um, with respect to corporate bonds and equity IPOs, we, um, prior to um, last year, most of the time we were a co-managing underwriter. And so what we try to do, we cover all the largest institutional investors, of course, everyone does, but we also try to provide access um, to second and third tier investors, some of whom are minority and women owned so that they get access to corporate bonds and equity IPOs. So we provide great diversification of investor base by having our firm be engaged. Let me ask you a few questions about the muni market because it's pretty darn interesting right now because, well, for one thing, at the onset of the pandemic, investors pulled money from muni funds for fear of localities would face revenue shortfalls. What was it like weathering that period of uncertainty and what's the status of the muni market these days? Well, you should know my perspective is this was the third um, crisis that I had seen in the muni market since I started in 1987. Just a couple months after I started in the business, we had Black Monday. Then we had the Great Recession um, where the market shut down for a period of time. And then last year, of course, with the onset of the pandemic, it brought the municipal market to a virtual standstill. Um, we, as you mentioned, we saw significant outflows from bond funds and it led to massive wave of selling. Um, what we did as a firm, um, because our clients were all very concerned, you know, municipalities need to access the markets on a regular basis is we set up um, twice a week um, town halls and we had economists, we had the head of the teachers union, we had um, you know, credit rating agencies all come in and talk and institutional buyers talk about their views of the market so that we could give our municipal clients access to information and understand better um, you know, what was occurring and how quickly things might open up. So around last um, May, we started to see some improvement and that continued throughout the rest of the year to now. Um, we've now seen 27 weeks of positive inflows into the markets and the technical strength of the market has continued, allowing really municipals to resist the swings that we saw perhaps in the treasury market. Um, we think investors have a lot of cash to put to work which um, has led to both low absolute rates. The 10-year MMD is below 1%. Um, and we just think it's a great time to issue. And we see that other issuers think that's the case because this week is a really big, big week. There's 10 billion um, expected to come this week and it's all expected to be placed you know, quite well. Let me ask you about um, the proposed infrastructure uh, spend by Congress, $4 trillion. Does that make sense to you? And would that impact muni markets? Yes, I, I think um, you should understand my perspective is I used to be a civil engineer. So oh. I am pro infrastructure. Um, state and local government entities really provide um, funding for our nation's infrastructure through the municipal bond market. Um, I think any plan that helps um, our country get from the D plus has been for so many years, I think we just emerged to C, um, but for us to be competitive globally, we need to get to the A, B range is gonna be invaluable to, the, to our country and to our economy. Um, what will happen is we hope to see municipalities leverage the infrastructure bill they will probably have to issue more bonds to match some of the funding from the federal level. So we think overall, it will be very positive to supply um, and obviously make our municipalities stronger going forward. So they're not doing the emergency fixes rather than you know, deep investment that will be impactful and, and positively impact our uh, infrastructure going forward. Switching over to corporates, there's been a boom uh, lately in corporate borrowing. Why is that business surging? 
And where do you see it headed? Well, interest rates, you know, continue to be very attractive. Um, we're all watching the Fed and have an expectation that rates will rise. So I think companies are really going to market to take advantage of, you know, very positive conditions right now. We have been a huge beneficiary of that growth. Um, we have been involved in more corporate transactions um, than ever in 2020. And it looks like our the number of deals in 21 will um, eclipse what we did last year. Um, and we also have had an increasing role with joint lead managed positions for corporations, which has been very exciting for us, um, which means we're able to play a better role. Uh, we're able to earn more dollars on the transactions we're you know, participating in, and we're able to satisfy our investor appetite by participating at a higher level. And I have to tell you, this increased focus on elevating, you know, firms like ours um, is steeped in, we, you know, have performed so well for many years, but it's really been, I think, a, big, a bit of a wake up with corporations that we do add value and we can serve in this capacity. And we really have to thank, I think, the social justice movement for that increased interest in engaging with firms like ours. Yeah, I want to talk more about that. Um, I want to ask you about IPOs also, but first, are you in Detroit and the firm is on Wall Street? You're kind of in both places. How does that work? Well, let's just say um, I was probably in the New York office more than Detroit pre-pandemic. <laughs> um, I'm a two million miler. I spend a lot of time on the road in front of clients and a lot of time in our New York office, which is our largest office. We are actually duly headquartered in New York in California, we have 19 offices. We have people spread all over. That served us well during the pandemic. Um, I've been mostly stationed here in Detroit um, since the pandemic, although I have been back to New York, um, you know, once I got vaccinated quite a bit. Um, and so, um, you know, the pandemic um, has caused us all to operate, you know, a little differently. And, um, you know, we're trying to be flexible with our employees. Um, we have people coming back on a rolling basis, so to speak, so that everyone's not in at the same time. Um, I'm fortunate because most of our employees are vaccinated. Um, we're studying, you know, Biden's vaccine mandate to, you know, determine what steps to take, but we're hoping we can get most, if not all employees back um, mid-October and I'm looking forward to getting my booster and getting back back to the New York office on a regular basis. Complicated stuff to figure out with, with employees for sure, Suzanne. Yes. Getting back to the business a little bit though, IPOs, we've seen this incredible surge uh, this year, even amidst the uncertainty of the pandemic. Why do you think that is? You're, you're so right. Um, the second quarter, uh, was the largest quarter, I think, in 20 years in terms of IPO proceeds raised and deal count, and much driven by the healthcare sector and biotech um, in particular um, led the pack. So it's really been the most active we've seen in you know, 20 years. Um, and um, I think proceeds have reached um, 80 billion so far this year surpassing the volume raised in all of last year. I think low interest rates have pushed up valuations for growth companies and the hundreds of unicorns in the pipeline are looking to take advantage of that. Um, and I think we're seeing companies um, that both benefited from the pandemic as well as those that are you know, sort of rebooting post pandemic. Um, that has really been um, sparking this increased um, deal flow. Um, earlier in the year, um, you know, inflation concerns had investors worried that the Federal Reserve might change its policy. But after the Fed, you know, said that inflation wouldn't change over the long term, it's really been, you know, robust IPO time. Absolutely. I do want to drill down a little bit into diversity and particularly on Wall Street and your business. You're the first minority and women-owned firm to rank in the top 10 uh, of all U.S. municipal debt underwriters. How does that unique leadership set you apart from your peers and also impact the work that you do? 
Well, I think it helps give us a bit of perspective. Um, you know, I've been in the business 33 years, and I have to tell you, not all years did we tout that we were a diversity firm because it was almost used as a limiting factor, um, you know, against the firm, despite the fact that we do billion dollar deals, despite the fact that we have very strong investor relationships. So what's been most encouraging to me is that um, the discussion around DE&I um, and the fact that we're both majority women owned and majority minority owned is now viewed to be an asset. And it's a discussion, you know, in every corporate boardroom um, at every level. Um, finance was, um, as you probably know, the last place people consider for diversity. And we have constant conversations with Fortune 500 CEOs, CFOs, and treasurers about how they can be more diverse, how they can impact more diversity within their finance teams, within corporate America. And so I think we're viewed as a unique resource at this time when corporations are grappling with um, how to provide equal opportunity for all. So what are some ideas, can you share some ideas that you share with those C-suite executives, Suzanne, in terms of trying to bring more DE&I in terms of all their constituents? Well, what we suggest is that they take a deep dive and an honest look at their workforce, their um, procurement practices, and their mentorship and sponsorship of diverse talent. You can well imagine a young African-American coming into a corporation and not seeing many people that look like you know, them, that that could be pretty in discouraging. People wanna see people who look like them. So we really have to focus on pipeline of talent and make dramatic change if we don't see diverse candidates in that pipeline of talent. We also have to be honest about everyone has some form of unconscious bias. And so we really need to talk about it more and ensure that bias and preconceived perceptions are not playing a role in advancement decisions. Um, and you know, it's a little more than mentorship, it's sponsoring, it's giving good feedback and really making diversity um, a real focus. On Wall Street in particular, we've done a horrible job and we went backwards after the financial crisis. I think women and minorities were let go in much higher numbers than others. And I think what we learned from that is we really have to, we, we see hiring at entry level um, to be very comparable. You know, it's, it's pretty good for women and people of color. But as we move through the ranks, we see those numbers just decline dramatically. Um, and so I think the more we talk about it, the more we get diversity on corporate boards so that there's pressure to, you know, CEOs to keep this front and center, the more progress we're going to see. It's not going to happen overnight. I think we have to be patient, but I am encouraged that it's really front and center discussion at every level of corporate America. Yeah, I like that first point in particular that you made about doing a deep dive, measuring accountability. We did that at Yahoo Finance, measured the guests that we had on our programming. And now we do that to sort of understand where we are and where we need to go um, in terms of diversity. Yes, and if companies look at you know, for example, um, their procurement practices. We have to support um, Black businesses and marginalized communities in every way in the communities we serve. And so, you know, I think my firm has thrived by working with companies and municipalities who value diversity and don't use it as an exclusionary factor. Tell us about the Clear Vision Impact Fund. Where does that fund stand now? What is it and, and how does it work? Well, it's a fund um, supported by our corporate clients that we came up with as a means to support underserved communities. Um, after the uh, murder of George Floyd last year and all the events that we saw erupt around the country in terms of protests, um, several of our corporate clients came to us and said, 
we'd love to figure out a solution. What can we do to help minority communities? And so um, what we did was we started with um, five major corporations, you know all their names, Microsoft, Apple, Comcast, eBay, and Constellation Brands, um, who are limited partners, we're the general partner, and we launched an investment vehicle that is debt oriented that will provide capital to minority owned businesses and underserved communities. And what we want to do is um, provide funds for entities that might not otherwise get you know, bank loans e easily. We saw even with the distribution of the PPP loans that minority companies had a tougher time getting access in those early rounds. Um, and so what we're trying to do, we don't wanna take equity if we don't have to, if they can't support that, we will look at equity options. But what we hope to do is provide company, companies that are already operating, but would grow to scale. Um, and hopefully they're hiring and impacting, you know, disadvantaged groups, for example, one company that we're investing in is a disaster recovery firm. Well, a lot of their employees are ex-convicts who are trying to make the transition back into the workforce. Um, we also looked at a compounding pharmacy that is the only minority-owned registered compounding uh, pharmacy in the country um, to provide them additional capital. So um, it's very exciting and I think um, we're, we've just been proud to mobilize some of the world's most successful companies and supporting many of the best minds out there in our communities that have been overlooked for so long. Sounds like some great work. Let me switch over and ask you some more questions about the markets and the business though, Suzanne. And I wanna ask you about inflation because um, you know that's a hot button topic. Is it transitory or not? What do you think? Well, um, I have tried not to, I, our business seems to thrive when, um, uh, at least the bond side of the business, when there's bad news and in the marketplace and we can keep interest rates very low, that uh, spurs great issuance um, in terms of volume. Um, but, you know, I just hope that the Fed is very measured as we proceed, we do feel that, and we see the data that inflation you know, is a factor in the marketplace. But I also think that we, um, you know, we have a huge um, wage shortage now. Um, we're seeing that in several different markets in the country. And I listened to three economists speak yesterday about inflation. Um, and they each had a slightly different twist. So I'm not sure I'm equipped to um, opine about uh, views, but I think we, we have to strap in and expect that inflation is coming. And I hope the Fed um, takes a very measured approach such that um, you know, they don't move too quickly. Right, I mean, there's, there's a lot on the table there for Jay Powell tapering, of course, but at the same time, inflation, some interesting choices that he has to make. Another regulator I want to ask you about, uh, SEC Chair uh, Gary Gensler said recently he wants to impose greater transparency on the corporate board and municipal bond markets. Is he right that there is more transparency needed, Suzanne? Well, I, you know, I recently uh, sat on the SEC Fixed Income Market Structure Committee, and we felt that there was enough transparency in the marketplace. Um, but, you know, we think, I, I think I'm very focused on their efforts around greater disclosure. Um, both the municipal bond market and the corporate market have very different disclosure requirements. And there's been a lot of talk about municipals coming up to speed, you know, to the same requirements as corporations in terms of you know, disclosing financial conditions, which is really tough because you have municipalities that are super tiny with not a lot of resources. And um, it's been sort of a commoditized, you know, industry. We saw with the financial crisis that, um, you know, 
uh, you could not rely just on the rating agencies to determine your buying decisions. Um, so, you know, I welcome the view. I hope that the SEC engages with market participants, um, investors, you know, underwriters, issuers, um, to gain, you know, the full view of next steps with respect to transparency. I personally don't believe that um, there's a lot of work to do in that space. I want to ask you about retail investors, maybe slightly out of your primary wheelhouse, but you're, you're moving that direction if you're doing IPOs. We've seen this rise in retail investing amid the pandemic. Um, things are, are changing with SPACs, and, um, the meme stocks. What do you make of all of these phenomena? Are there positives or do we need to protect investors from themselves? What's your thinking there? You know, um, the, it's really changed. Um, now we serve um, only uh, retail investors through uh, separate managed accounts. Um, you know, as a firm, we don't sell directly to retail. But, you know, obviously as a market participant, we see the impact of retail, which has been, um, you know, quite significant. Um, I think the advent of, you know, uh, the average investor, individual gaining access to CNBC and Yahoo and um, other uh, mediums gives retail investors more information. Used to be a time that institutional investors you know, we're the only ones who had hot breaking news. And now I think everyone gets hot breaking news. Um, you know, the question is whether all of them, they seem to run in packs and move together um, and pile on as opposed to, um, you know, making the same measured um, investment decisions that institutions do. But there's no doubt that the retail factor is here, is here to stay, and it's going to play a significant role in how stocks you know, move around on a daily basis. I wanna shift gears a little bit and ask you about you because you have a pretty remarkable background which you alluded to a little bit, but starting out, my understanding is you were reading at age three and reading aloud to a class of fifth graders when you're in kindergarten. How did that all come about and did that influence your approach to learning later in life? Absolutely. I was raised by a teacher. My mom uh, graduated from Spelman College at 19 years old, became a teacher, uh, later a school administrator. And she had me reading uh, very early. Um, you know, I grew up in a small town, Savannah, Georgia. Uh, we didn't have all the distractions that kids have today. So reading in school were, you know, my uh, top interests. Um, and, you know, I also saw my parents work, um, rarely take a day off to be sick, rarely take holidays. They worked long hours. And so all of that influenced me. I think it taught me um, the power of preparation. Um, I had a front row seat um, and watching my mother as a teacher transform the lives of many students. Um, I saw how knowledge could be a ticket to greater things. Um, it was really others who saw in me my potential. Um, for example, one of them was my high school guidance counselor. My first um, uh, goal in life was to be a social worker. And my counselor, L.P. Parrish, took me aside one day and said, you should pursue uh, an engineering degree. You're great in math and science. And so um, the key for me was she said, if you do that, you're gonna get multiple job offers and you can take care of yourself. So I took her advice. I uh, went off to Georgia Tech, got a degree in civil engineering. Um, I worked uh, at General Dynamics before going off to Wharton to business school. And it was really at Wharton that I learned about Wall Street. I had really, I might've heard about stocks and bonds, but really had no understanding of um, the markets. And, um, you know, that's how I got to Wall Street. But I, I've got to tell you, uh, my path wasn't an easy one. Um, most of my peers had been analysts on Wall Street before coming to uh, Wharton, and they all had automatic jobs uh, for the summer. 
I didn't. I took a subway map and pounded on doors. And that was how I got my first job uh, on Wall Street. And before that, though, just going back to growing up in Savannah, and you've talked about systemic racism that you faced there, including your dad being listed on your birth certificate, I guess, as a, quote, Negro laborer, unquote. How, how did you navigate that? And what should be done to make sure young kids now don't have to uh, bear those kinds of uh, trials and tribulations? Yeah, it is quite stunning to think about um, the racism, you know, that I saw. And, you know, I don't know if I um, felt it as much as I saw what my parents experienced and they did everything they could to protect me um, and my exposure to it, but it, it was certainly was front and center. You know, I think that, um, you know, we've come a long way and there are some great examples um, of African-Americans rising in segments, but, we have a long way to go until the majority of us has the opportunity um, ahead of us. I was lucky to have a network of people, mentors. And so, you know, what I've tried to do personally and we try to do as a firm is pro provide those early exposures, that mentorship and sponsorship, provide access to the world of finance that um, many young people don't get. I, I did a program for uh, 10 years in Detroit where we gave high school students um, exposure to the world of finance by working in firms and mentoring them. And, and it really has made a difference. We have one young man now we just hired at Clear Vision who was one of those high school students, um, you know, years ago, tw over 20 years ago. And um, that's just been really exciting, but it's proof. There are story after story that if we give the opportunity, if we give the exposure, if we provide educational opportunities through scholarships, um, that it really will serve to change um, the foundation of um, opportunity in America. And final question, Suzanne, what is your advice for young people, maybe especially young women, who want to have a career like yours? Well, I, there's no, there was no playbook for becoming a Black woman CEO on Wall Street. So I have learned that um, anyone who hears my story hopefully will feel that they have the opportunity, opportunity to do whatever they'd like. I would say always educate yourself, not in the, just in the classroom, but throughout life being the most prepared will help you win in any room. Um, I would say be curious and embrace the things that make you different because they can be your competitive advantage. Um, integrity is hu huge. Protect your in integrity no matter what. And I often say lift as you climb. As you move through the world, always remember you can help others because in the end, helping others is what you know, makes life all about. That's fantastic advice. Suzanne Shank, CEO of Seabird Williams and Shank. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much. You've been watching Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.